Welcome to Exploring the Scripture Readings for Sunday's Liturgy, Session 11, Sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time, Year B. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. As we continue through our Sunday readings and also the lessons they teach us, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that we're talking about an image or a message that was given to us many centuries ago, well, 2,000 years ago. And yet somehow we're asked to make it apply to our present day. And very often it does. The danger is that many people do not see the connection between the words of Jesus, the message of Jesus, even the times of Jesus and our own day. It's not exactly the same thing that happens, but it's something similar, something that connects to our present day. So as we read the scriptures for each Sunday, we look for that connection. We take Jesus' words and say, what does Jesus have? And Jesus' word is beyond time. It's not something that says, okay, I'm only preaching for the people of my own era. Jesus didn't just do that. He left a message with the people of his own era. But now we, we look at the readings and we begin to say, well, what do the readings tell us? about our present day. That is a way of meditating, a way of reading the scripture and saying, what does it tell us about our present day? Today in the Gospel of Mark, it talks about Jesus meeting a leper. Lepers in Jesus' day, that they were people who had different kinds of skin disease that couldn't be identified. And so very often they were called lepers when actually there was some kind of a boil or something on their face. But then what happens is now we begin the story. In those days, in Jesus' day, lepers had to stay apart. They had to ring a bell and keep shouting, unclean, unclean, so that no one would come near them. In many ways, it was kind of a pandemic of the day. There were many lepers. And so people were really ostracized in some way, kept away from the people, the rest of the people. And then we jump from there to our present day. We don't have leprosy anymore, at least not as contagious as it once was because we understand the disease. What was happening actually up to the 1800s or more, we didn't understand the disease. And so many people were ostracized who had leprosy. But then in our own day, we had something similar to leprosy. Similar in the sense that it was contagious, it affected many people, and people were afraid of it. We had COVID. We had a pandemic. And it's interesting to see how the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, really had certain rules about it that was similar to the rules for leprosy and also some of the effects. So for instance, leprosy, it affected the taste and the smell of people who had leprosy. They couldn't taste anymore. They lost their sense of smell. In COVID, we lost, or those who had COVID, lost a sense of smell. They lost the sense of taste. It was one of the effects of COVID. And then what happened as a result of that, we have a second step, isolation. The lepers in Jesus' day, they had to ring a bell and shout unclean so the people would stay away from them. They were isolated. When someone had leprosy or suddenly discovered to have leprosy, they were immediately shunned. They had to leave their family. They couldn't be with their family anymore. The community was afraid. And we saw at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, 
people were now isolated. Nursing homes were shut down. People had to talk to their loved ones through glass, through the windows. And so isolation came into effect. And many people had to stay away from each other, like leprosy. A third thing that happened during leprosy is that people had to keep themselves covered in some way. They had to dress a certain way. They weren't allowed to take care of their beards for men. What happened with a lot of them too, and shouting out unclean, they were unkempt. And yet what happens now, we're forced to cover up with a mask, simple, much simpler than that. But the idea behind it, they had to use some kind of a design to keep them from sharing this. And then what happened? They had close contacts. They people had to tell close contacts, I have COVID. Don't come near me. Stay away. Anybody who had leprosy had to stay away from others. And again, it's close to the idea. Look what was happening. Isolation, lo losing taste, losing smell. And then what happened? They had the symptoms. They cleared. But even when the symptoms cleared, they had to prove it in some way. There had to be someone to say, well, you don't have it anymore. You have to stay in quarantine for so many days. Same thing happened with leprosy. And then the interesting thing, perhaps very much like leprosy, the pandemic, is that it was airborne. It was sent around or contact contracted through droplets. They didn't know that. All they knew was that it was contagious. But we read the story about the lepers and we think, well, that was in Jesus' day, it was a terrible thing. But it was a terrible thing when it came in a new form in our life. When suddenly we found ourselves living through a similar situation. But you know, the fortunate thing about our era is that we know what caused it. We know how it spread. We know in many ways, not we didn't know perhaps the original cause, but we know what it caused from person to person. So we had to be very careful, but see how similar it was. So we have that now in today's readings and suddenly scripture comes alive. Scripture is saying to us, look at the era, look at what Jesus is saying to us. See how it really affects our life. So it says in the gospel, a leper came to Jesus and kneeling down, begged him. Kneeling was a form of praise of God, private prayer. In those days, back in the early church, when people praised God as a community, they stood. But then what was happening here was private prayer in a sense, beseeching one person to the other. They knelt down. That leper was not seeing himself, herself, as a member of the community, actually they were cast out of the community. They were shunned. So kneeling down. And he said to Jesus, if you wish, you can make me clean. He recognizes that prayer is saying to God, God, if, if it's your will. So many times we see where Mary, for instance, says to Jesus, thy will be done. And the other times too, we see it Follow the will of God. So if it be your will, if you wish, you can make me clean. And so just the idea of, of leprosy, where did it come from? What was their fear and how did they react to it? Back in Jesus' day, they had religious laws. They believed that God caused all forms of, of illness. And so what happened is if a person became very ill, that's a sign that they were sinful, that God wasn't pleased with them. The man in the paralytic who was lowered through the roof, what does Jesus do? Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And everybody's saying, there's no sign that his sins are forgiven. Jesus knows the way people think. And so Jesus says to him, take your mat and walk. The idea again, let us see some physical miracle here. But now as we talk about lepers, people knew that this was something was passed on. 
they didn't realize was airborne. They didn't realize with droplets. People picked it up from other people. So now what happens very often, the laws of Judaism really are based upon it, what's, what they see in front of them. What's happening? People ate pork and became sick. That goes back even before Judaism. Finally, there was a writings against eating pork. People didn't realize that it carried germs more readily than some other forms of meat. And so restraining from pork became part of the Jewish law, a way of really thinking that God is punishing here, but also protecting the people against sickness. So in the first reading is taken from the book of Leviticus. Leviticus is one of the first five books of the Bible. The, the Sadducees, they believed only in the first five books. The Pharisees believed in the prophets. They believed in Jeremiah. They believed they were the word of God. But the, the Sadducees did it. They were centered on the temple, and it was only the rules in those first five books that really affected them. Leviticus, the fourth of the five books. And so it happens. It says here that in the book of Leviticus, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron. So God is giving the word to Moses and Aaron. If someone has on his skin a scab, a postule, or a blotch, which appears to be the sore of leprosy, he shall be brought to Aaron the priest, or to one of the priests among his descendants. So it's going to go on beyond the Aaron. It was going to continue. Aaron is like the father of the, the, the family. So of the Levite family, they had many, many who were priests. But then the one priest in the temple, the one who was the more the liturgical priest, was Aaron and his descendants. So they would bring it to one of the priests, one of Aaron's descendants. The priest would be able to judge by looking at the person whether the person is declared to have leprosy. Very often, they didn't have leprosy. But they didn't understand these things on the skin. And so they could say, well, this person has leprosy. So if a person looked like they had leprosy, they now had to no longer take care of their beard if it was man. Their clothing had to reflect this penitence. They were isolated from the community. They had to carry a bell that said unclean. People would leave them food, but back off, stay away from them. And the really most difficult thing is that they had to leave their family immediately, sometimes being forced to leave their families. So it goes on to say, if a man is leprous and unclean, the priest shall declare him unclean by reason of the sore on his head. So the priests are the ones who really make a judgment here. They are like the doctors in a sense, but they tie it into their spirituality as they understood it. And so the priest in those days, the descendants of Aaron, are the ones who made this declaration. And we talk about the leper himself in the first reading in the book of Leviticus. The one who bears the sore of leprosy shall keep his garments rent and his head bare and shall muffle his beard. He shall cry out, unclean, unclean. He has to warn the people, stay away from me. And even by his appearance or her appearance, they had to show themselves to have leprosy. And once people heard the bell ring or the unclean, unclean, they would stay away. They would, they would be frightened of this because they knew that if they picked up leprosy, they themselves would be ostracized from the community. And Leviticus continues, as long as the sore is on him, he shall declare himself unclean since he is in fact unclean. He shall dwell apart, making his abode outside the camp. So he wasn't allowed to live with the people. In the 1800s, people were sent to an island called Molokai. It was an island in the Pacific. And what happened is they, instead of just saying they're unclean, they, they shipped them to an island. 
And it was a very depressed place, dark, dark in the sense that people went there to die. They would never see their loved ones again. And again, it could happen in an instant. Some kind of a soul could show up. And the people of the 1800s or earlier were very much afraid of this dreaded disease. Since that time, they've discovered what caused what we call leprosy. It's really something they can cure and do cure, and it's not contagious. So if we've ever met somebody who had leprosy, we would say, well, they're cured. Hansen disease is what we call it now. And so it's something that they were far from understanding back in Jesus' day. So it becomes a religious law. And that's how the laws and religion really happened in many cases. So it's a law from the book of Leviticus. The people had to obey it now, not only to avoid being with a leper, but to avoid being unclean. Anybody who touched a leper or worked with a leper was considered unclean. They had to wash, and then they had to spend so much time, months, it could be, in preparation in prayer. So they would be isolated from the community and they would have the consequences, even though there's nothing showing up on their face, they had to be declared clean eventually by the priest. The priests, of course, were not like the priests of our modern day. From modern day priests, they're, they're ordained. These are ordained priests, we call them. But back in those days, it was on a family. It was, in a sense, from one generation to the next in the same family. Now we come to the responsorial psalm. In the responsorial psalm, we pray, I turn to you, Lord, in time of trouble. We need God's help. We needed God's help during our pandemic. It's applying to our present day. There's other things that are going to happen, things that we have to continue to do because we know how diseases can be spread. But back in those days, they had no idea of germs or bacteria or anything like that. They just simply saw what happened, made their judgments. So I turn to you, Lord, in time of trouble, and you fill me with the joy of salvation. The joy of salvation, of course, means eternal life with God. But the joy of salvation also means what Jesus brings here and now. We are called to love God. And once we put ourselves in God's presence, in a sense, we're sharing in salvation. It's not just something that happens to us hereafter. It's going on now with our faith in Jesus, trust in Jesus, and abandoning ourselves in a sense to the love of Jesus. So we now have our verses. Blessed is he whose fault is taken away, whose sin is covered. Blessed the person to whom the Lord imputes not guilt, in whose spirit there is no guile. So it's simply saying, blessed is the healthy person. And at the same time, not just healthy physically, but healthy mentally, one who loves God, one who is faithful. So again, looking back in those days, the idea is that faithfulness doesn't just bring physical health at times, but it brings spiritual health. Second verse, then I acknowledge my sin to you, my guilt I covered not. I didn't make believe I didn't have guilt. So I couldn't cover it. I had to confess. I said, I confess my faults to the Lord. And you took away the guilt of my sin. God is the one who brings cleansing. So we turn to God. It says, I turn to you, Lord, in time of trouble. And you fill me with the joy of salvation. Third verse, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you just. Exult, O you upright of heart. A healing has taken place. So in that psalm, we're saying, God, I, I, I'm in trouble. I need your help. And I know you're going to help me. You fill me with the joy of salvation. You bring me into the joy of peace, love, right now, not just hereafter. It's part of my journey. I turn to you in time of trouble, and you fill me with the joy of salvation. 
Then we come to the second reading. And then the second reading is from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. The gospel, as I mentioned earlier, follows from previous gospels. In other words, where it ended off last week, we begin this week. Same thing with the letters. At times, because the letters have that same sequence from the ending of last week to this week, it doesn't always follow the theme. But because it is talking about God and God's love and God's health in our life, we can say it fits very often into the theme. So this is continuation of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, Paul says, whenever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Avoid giving offense, whether to the Jews or Greeks or the church of God. So what he's saying is that everything we do belongs to God. Our, our whole life is a prayer. At times we meet someone and someone might say, well, I really didn't pray well today. I did my morning prayer, but then I forgot about God. Whereas others can say, but my offering, my prayer, my eating is a prayer because it's what God told me to do in a sense by creating me. Not verbally, but I know I have to do that. I have to eat to keep healthy. That's a prayer in a sense. Once I make it, Lord, I offer this. We begin our meals with prayers. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Everything we do during the day, we may not think of God, but if we can avoid sin or avoid hurting someone, then we are really giving our life to God. We don't have to be thinking of God all the time. It's impossible, actually, because there are things that distract us. But to keep God in the way of thinking. So avoid giving offense, whether to the Jews or Greeks or the church of God. So the rule number one from Paul, avoid giving offense. There's a spiritual leprosy, giving offense. So avoid that. Just as I, Paul, try to please everyone in every way, not seeking my own benefit. Paul doesn't say, well, what do I want from me? He's not selfish. He's not seeking his own benefit, but he's seeking that of the many, means the community. And everything he does is for the community, that the community may be saved. And so that's what he's thinking. He's thinking, I have a message to share. I have a life to share with them. His life is a prayer. His day is a prayer. And Paul feels that he's imitating God to the best he can. And so he knows God's love. He wants to imitate God's love. And he can finally say, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. We have models in the world. We see how they imitated Christ, saints. We look to the saints and we say, well, they imitated Christ. Sometimes the simplest person can really be very saintly just by living their life well, by loving people, by helping people. We see that happening. By praying for people if they can't do anything else. What happens is be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So that's Paul's prayer. We go now to the gospel. And as I said already, it was a gospel about Jesus meeting a leper. In the previous weeks, we talked about Jesus going into a, into a synagogue, healing people, teaching people, then finally healing many. And in prayer, he says, I must move on. And so he's going on now. The prayer helps him to focus on his ministry. So now we've moved into Jesus' ministry. The days begin to pass. And now a leper came to Jesus and kneeling down, begged him and said, if you wish, you can make me clean. So the leper is saying, God, <laughs> terrible burden. But God, if you wish, you can make me clean. Move with pity. This is God. God is moved with pity. And we ask us, oh, why didn't God just make everything wonderful? Because we have to take initiative. The leper had to say, Lord, if you wish, you can make me clean. 
take away my leprosy, but not my will, but yours be done. He's willing to suffer, but at the same time, give him the strength. Move with pity, typical of Jesus. It says many times, move with pity, move with compassion, move with mercy. That's the kind of God we have. We say, thank God that God is so loving and merciful. And that should permeate our being. And so he says, Jesus said to him, I do will it be made clean. Jesus wants us all to be made clean spiritually. Sometimes we pray for something and we say, God, you're not answering my prayer. And that's where we say, whatever your will is, God, I'm willing to accept it. And very often there are answers to prayer that we don't see. Strength, inner strength, strength in our spirit that helps us to carry on. We don't see the physical change, but there's something that comes into us without us even feeling or knowing it, but suddenly saying, well, whatever you will, God, I'm willing to go along with it. But in this case now, the leper is healed. The leprosy left him immediately and he was made clean. You realize that what happens to the leper is done for a purpose. There are many other lepers in the day of Jesus. Jesus doesn't heal them all. He heals this man because Jesus is teaching a lesson. Jesus doesn't come simply to heal. He comes to share a message. The healing very often tells us one thing about Jesus, but then the message that we hear from Jesus, we know is a message from God. Then Jesus warning him sternly, he dismissed him at once. He said to him, see that you tell no, no one anything, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer your cleansing what Moses prescribed. That will be proof for them. So it comes down to Jesus is saying, don't tell anybody about this. In Mark's gospel, we have what's called, as I mentioned before, the messianic secret. The secret that Jesus is the Messiah. He doesn't want that to spread yet. There's many suspicions why. One of them is that they were accepting or looking towards a warrior Messiah, someone who will lead them to battle, and that's not Jesus. But then the other idea is that if people see him as the Messiah, they'll flock him and it might ruin his message. They're looking for the healing part. They're looking for Jesus as a healer. And again, the idea being is that really Jesus becomes the Messiah when he fulfills his ministry. The passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus leads him on into his ministry. He is now the Messiah. And because of this, God highly exalted him. Because he was obedient to death, God highly exalted him. That's the fulfillment of the ministry of Jesus as the Messiah. So he's on a journey. The journey to fully becoming an image of the Messiah. But Jesus says, now, don't, don't tell anybody about this. When Jesus casts out demons, they identify him and he says, don't tell anybody. Be quiet. And the demon has to obey Jesus. The demon is controlled by Jesus. But it shows us here that human beings still have free will. So Jesus tells him not to tell anybody. But then what happened? The man went away and began to publicize the whole matter. Human being. Jesus can control the demons, but he can't control us in the sense that God gave us free will. And so he tells the man not to publicize the whole matter. But the man goes and does it anyway. And so as a result, it changes Jesus' kind of ministry. So the man goes and he says, he spread the report abroad, the report about his healing. And as a result, so that it was impossible for Jesus to enter a town openly. The people wanted to come out and be cured. They wanted healing. Healing, physical healing, was not totally Jesus' message. It always had a, a reason, a reason that looked beyond itself to emphasize, underline, Jesus' message. So he didn't come just to heal and only do the healing during his lifetime, and that was it. 
He came to give us a message that would carry on, a message that we live even today. And so what happens is his the spread he spread the report abroad, and it was impossible for Jesus to enter a town openly. Jesus now had to change his way of ministry because the man spread news about the miracle. And people would come swarming to him, heal me. But Jesus didn't come. He came to share a message. He passed on to human beings living that message. As Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Individually, we're called to be an imitator of Christ. That means we're supposed to be as much as we can be like Christ as far as loving, sharing, reaching out to others. But what's happened, he remained outside now because of the man spreading that news. Jesus had to remain outside in deserted places. The last time we read that Jesus went to a deserted place was to pray. But now, even in healing, he has to go to deserted places. He has to be away from the crowd. But the crowd comes to him. And the idea is he doesn't reject them. In fact, he changes his mood sometimes. We'll see later on. But Jesus now is meeting with the people. The people kept coming to him from everywhere. They flocked to him. And Jesus was trying to say, I come not to receive applause or to talk about just myself alone. I come to share the word of God that you might live the word of God and be healed. And the imagery here, of course, is a leper. Jesus heals a leper, someone who is an outcast from society. Jesus comes to help those who are outcast from society, those who are rejected. So that's very important to Jesus. In the scripture, we very often read that Jesus comes for the widow and, and the children, the orphan. And so we see what happens, what he's really Putting together in that is the idea he comes for those who are rejected, those who are on the outskirts. I was reading one time about this one man who was very, very good. In fact, I knew him. And he was someone who reached out. And it was someone who would, wherever they went, he always seemed to find the person who was rejected to the point where others, his close friends, would talk about him and say, Charlie, so-and-so, whatever his name. He's a friend of those who have no friends. That's Jesus. Jesus seemed to the people to be the friend of those who have no friends. And really, that's what a Christian's called to be. A friend of those who have no friends, but also a friend of those who do have friends. And so it's happening. We see that Jesus now, he heals the leper. He heals the outcast. He learns that the outcast is still a very loving, important person to God, even the sinner. The sinner can not just simply be said, well, he's a sinner, so the church should ignore him or her. The idea being that the church reaches out. In the Constitution on the Church and the Second Vatican Council, it says the church embraces sinners to its bosom. We see the present Pope, for instance, he reaches out to those who are considered to be sinners by many. Yet he says, well, let's give them a blessing. A blessing is a gift from God. Let's give them a blessing. And he points out that the blessing he gives is a blessing that comes from the church, from Christ. And so like Christ, he's willing to share the gifts of God with people because that's a great gift. And so as we read the scripture, we say, well, today <laughs> we're going through many of the things they went through years ago. But at the same time, how do we solve it? Do we ignore them, send them off, keep them cut out? Or do we really reach out to them in some way? And at the same time, have concern for their well-being. And the world is filled with those situations. There are many rejected people as we look around people who are causing problems for others because they've been rejected from their own homes. So we see that happening and we say, well, it's always a challenge. It's a challenge of love. 
given to us by Jesus. May the light of Christ lead me, the power of Christ be with me, the wisdom of Christ inspire me, the word of Christ instruct me, the shelter of Christ protect me, the hand of Christ hold me, and the love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me, the sad find joy in me, the depressed find hope in me, the weak find strength in me, the doubters find faith in me, the rejected find love in me, and the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.